This is the Brave New Coin Crypto Conversation, hosted by Andy Pickering. Andy Pickering here. I'm your host and welcome to the Crypto Conversation, a brave new coin podcast where we talk to the people building the future in the Bitcoin, blockchain and cryptocurrency space. My guest today is Fernando Martinelli. Fernando is the founder and CEO of Balancer, an automated asset management platform for programmable liquidity. And Balancer allows anyone to create uh, public or private liquidity pools for up to eight assets with customizable weighting. Welcome to the show, Fernando. Hey, Andy. Thanks for having me. So, as I said in, in the intro, you know, Balancer is an automated asset management platform platform for programmable liquidity and, and anyone can create these liquidity pools right so I guess for for anyone uh, listening Fernando who who isn't a, a regular DeFi user do you want to just maybe start off by explaining that in, in simple terms so I guess you know to begin with what is Balancer and, and what is the problem you're solving yeah sure so imagine you have two stocks like Amazon and, and Tesla and you want to make sure that if one of those goes up by a lot, you don't want to be overexposed um, to that. So you would probably rebalance at some point. So let's say Tesla went from 200 to 1,000. You would um, sell some at 300, sell some at 400, and all the way to, to 1,000, you're like cashing out, so to speak. But you're not selling that to dollars. You're selling that to uh, Amazon stock. So you're, you're actually making sure that if you started with, say, 80% Tesla and 20% Amazon, you're not going to end up with 90% Tesla because its price is going up relative to Amazon. So you, you're selling um, uh, Tesla for Amazon so to, in a way to be always at 80-20, which is the exposure you want to have. That's also how uh, an index fund works, right? So... Fidelity and, and, and many other um, service providers of index funds, what they do is they, they have like a basket of different assets and uh, you buy kind of into an ass, uh, a basket and that manager makes sure that they, they sell and buy um, the, the stocks or the, 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 yeah, the assets in that basket so as to re uh, keep, remain at the, the exposure, at the percentages that you choose. And Balancer does exactly that with ERC-20 tokens. So you can have um, a, a basket or a pool, the way we call it is a pool. You can have a liquidity pool of say 40% WETH, uh, wrapped ETH, 20% uh, wrapped Bitcoin and 40% um, DAI, for example. So yeah, that, that, that is kept for you as prices move around. If ETH goes up by a lot, Balancer will continuously um, sell WETH for, for the other two if, if WETH goes up relative to the other two. So it's, it's really um, an asset management protocol. And, and that's kind of the, the surface, like the tip of the iceberg. I can explain more, but that, that's kind of the overview of what it is. Yes, it is, and that's that's a, a really nicely said, and uh, and of course, you know, hence the name Balancer, right? Yeah. So, uh, look, we'll, we'll we'll get into more of this stuff, but uh, let's get some background on on yourself, then, Fernando. Do you want to just, I guess, introduce yourself and and tell us uh, just a little bit about your background and and what you were doing uh, before Balancer, and and I guess how you got interested in in the blockchain space and DeFi? Sure. So I'm a mechatronics engineer with a master's in image processing and robotics. I, so I have a very technical background, unfortunately not a software engineer. If I could back, go back in time, probably I would do that uh, because programming is so, so important. And I can't stress that uh, enough to, to people who are deciding what to do today, like young people. Anyways, uh, I, I'm, I'm very technical. I did also an MBA at the Sorbonne University very interested in starting new things, um, have a, I would say like an entrepreneurial spirit. I started my first company when I was 14, a cyber cafe, uh, and then kept creating companies. I worked as a strategy consultant for Bain & Company in Germany after my MBA in Paris. 
and created a company in Germany as well. Then um, I'm originally from Brazil, went back to Brazil. And uh, while I was creating those companies, I was kind of captivated by, by blockchain and Bitcoin back, back then. It was early 2013. Uh, actually late 2012 when I first heard of it and just dismissed it as a as a scam, as a, a Ponzi scheme. And then I kind of um, looked at it again and again. And then the third time I looked at it, it was early 2013. I realized like this is a revolution that's happening here. And um, when Ethereum came along, the, the, the white paper, I was like, yeah, this is what, so I, I realized with Bitcoin that volatility would never allow for mass adoption. So if we want crypto to be mass adopt, adopted, uh, we, we need some sort of stable crypto. And that is impossible with, uh, like with Bitcoin, right? So when Ethereum came along, I, the, the, the use case that most kind of interested me was this is what will allow us to have stable coins. And yeah, so I was I was very involved early on with the MakerDAO team. I did some collaborations around the the control mechanics of the of the target rate feedback mechanism, something that never got actually the, uh, deployed, but some some other projects are 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 doing that today. And yeah, in, in early 2018, I was following all the discussions around AMMs and Vitalik and Adam Liu. Um, back then, there was no Uniswap, but Hayden was already starting to work on it, um, like like myself uh, on Balancer. And then it, 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 I came I came to that idea of uh, yeah the value function and this constant mean uh, formula that has all the nice mathematical properties to allow for a pool with many assets and different weights to be kind of rebalanced automatically, like like I just said. So. This is kind of a bit of the background, and and as I have like developed the the idea, um, the the formula, the the frame, the mathematical framework was created early 2018. It was a long way, like modeling, designing, proving to people that it could work. And as Uniswap got live, it was uh, it made my my life a lot easier because I said, well, listen, if you believe in in Uniswap and it's there proving itself. Uh, then, then Balancer is just a generalization. It's like uh, Uniswap is, is an instance of Balancer. It's a Balancer pool. Uh, Uniswap pools are Balancer pools with two tokens and 50-50 weights and 0.3% trading fee. And Balancer allows you to customize all those three things, number of tokens, weights, and trading trading fee. So that uh, Uniswap helped me a lot to kind of convince people, people and, and get investors on board and kind of uh, get more people working on Balancer. Yeah, and this is where we are today. Yes, yes, indeed. And uh, I know that is definitely part of the conversation as, you know, uh, the differences and similarities, I guess, between uh, Balancer and, and Uniswap. But yeah, it just, you just talked about, I guess, um, you know, being aware of, of the work that Hayden was doing uh, prior to Uniswap or, or, you know, he was working on it around the same time as you back in, in 2018. And and I know you, you know you talked about the kind of the 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 math, right? The mathematical framework that is in, in, involved in these things. And I've I think in, in the white paper or, or on your website, you know, you were talking about exploring multi-dimensional invariant surfaces to come up with the powerful mathematical framework uh, that is required for you know these kind of uh, you know continuous self-balancing. So I guess just in in, in layman's terms, uh, from a, a, a software uh, engineer perspective or, or or a coding perspective, you know what what does that mean and how much uh, how much testing and, and work is is really involved? Yeah. So the the formula is quite simple and easy to express mathematically. But the, like the way it works and, and, and how to prove that it allows for self-balancing liquidity pools, that's the, the trickier part where most of the maths on the white paper is kind of, um, yeah, um, is, is on, like the proofs. But uh, yeah, the, maybe just to, 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 to try to explain how it works, it's, it's just like a, a a function of mathematical expression um, whose value cannot change when trades are done. So the same way Uniswap relies on X times Y equals K, 
that is the, the multiplication of the balances cannot change after a trade. We have something similar, but uh, slightly more complex. And if you think of that as um, like each of the balances is a dimension, then if you have a, a pool with three um, balances, then you have a three dimensional surface, which is actually on the fourth dimension because um, the surface itself is, is the value, energy value of uh, this function that has three inputs and one output. So basically it, it gets all the balances as inputs. So if you have five balances, it's a function that have five, has five inputs and outputs an energy level, um, if, you, if you may think of that that way. So the energy cannot change if there's no fees, but if there are fees, then that energy always increases or the value function always increases. That means that um, whatever happens to the prices, if the prices go back to the original uh, value, so all, all the tokens relative to each other go back to the initial um, start, starting point when you add a liquidity, you're always going to have more liquidity than you put initially. So you're going to make money. Uh, there is something called impermanent loss, which is um, a very interesting and important concept in the world of AMMs. I can get into that, but it's, it's, uh, it's a risk relative to holding tokens. Uh, when you when you invest or you add liquidity to an AMM, be it Balancer or, or Uniswap, you have the risk of uh, impermanent loss. And I, I can get into that if you want, but it's it's well documented and discussed in uh, in the community. So if you look for impermanent loss, AMM uh, on Google, you're going to have a lot of uh, resources to read on. Yes, indeed. Uh, and look, I think anyone that is, uh, you know, playing around with DeFi or, or, or even crypto understands that, uh, you know, there are certain in inherent risks. Um, but that's that, that's finance in general, right? Yeah, so uh, Balancer is, you know, it, you describe it as a, a, f a financial primitive. Uh, and so that's that's one way of understanding it. You know, it's a it's a fundamental building block in DeFi. It's an asset management platform. It's an AMM. It can also be a, a DEX and there are other kind of use cases, right? So I guess, is that your take on Balancer or is, is there kind of one underlying vision? Yeah, that, what you said is very important. So Balancer doesn't work. It, it wouldn't rebalance anyone's pools if uh, there weren't the other side of the of the market. So I see Balancer and Uniswap as well. It's a two-sided market. So you have the liquidity providers who want to have their um, their index funds rebalanced and also make some money if possible, like with fees. And that, that is up to them to decide how much trading fees and percentage their pools will have. If you want to just have a, 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 a rebalancing mechanism or feature, you can just say the fee is zero but then you only have impermanent loss. So you have to know that whatever prices go, you would be better off uh, holding your tokens unless it's hard to rebalance them afterwards. So if, if it's tokens that are not so liquid, then uh, even if you have a zero fee, the balancer is already doing you a service or providing you a service by rebalancing because um, impermanent loss is really on the paper. Like uh, if you calculate what you would have if you ha had held your tokens, then you would have more, but maybe you wouldn't be able to sell all those tokens for the market price right now, right? Because if they're not liquid, then it's just like paper value. Anyway, so um, there is this other side of the equation, which is the DEX. So Balancer uh, provides liquidity. All the pools on Balancer, they allow anyone to trade in any direction across any pair that that pool contains. So if you have a pool with uh, ETHI and MKR, Anyone trading MKR for DAI will be able to tap on your your pool. So yeah, so the the, the, the fact that we have a two sided market means that um, we we need both uh, both of those actors for the system to work. So if you think of uh, of um, a balancer as a DAX, you're actually thinking of uh, the the traders that want to tap on onto the liquidity that's on balancer. And if you want to see Balancer as an asset management management tool or uh, our self-balancing um, yeah, liquidity pool protocol, then you are actually thinking from the liquidity provider side. So there's 
both both sides of, of the equation. Exactly right. And wh- how would you describe the 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 target market or or the target user? Then do you kind of split them and and into those two sides? And look, I imagine the the kind of you have a a, a bigger eventual vision, and and you obviously want to grow the market. So how 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 do you approach that? Yeah, absolutely. So our main focus, and I think this is uh, where we kind of um, differentiate uh, ourselves a bit from Uniswap. Our main focus is on the asset management side of things, whereas yeah. Uniswap seems to be like more the exchange, like the decentralized exchange. So we, we, we think that if we make sure that all the use cases, all the needs um, of liquidity providers are kind of um, really catered for uh, by us, then liquidity providers will come to Balancer for many reasons, and and one of them is like just to put their crypto to work and generate some interest. Some will be uh, just rebalancing their portfolios. Some will be like institutions like DAOs that need to hold different types of crypto, and they don't want to be overexposed in one of them if that goes up by a lot, and they don't want to go um, actively always trading their uh, their treasuries to to make sure that it's uh, it's balanced. So they just put it uh, on Balancer and Balancer does that automatically. Actually, instead of charging fees, Balancer gives investors uh, or at, like liquidity providers uh, trading fees. So it's, it's like uh, it, it inverts the idea of a conventional index fund where the, the, the investors in that, in that index fund, they need to pay a fee for the admin, for the manager to, to manage it. it. It actually pays people to provide liquidity to that uh, index fund. So yeah, we, we, we believe that as more and more use cases appear for liquidity providers, we will have more and more liquidity. And as long as Balancer is well connected to uh, all the aggregators, all the different types of um, liquidity um, consumers, right? The, those that consume liquidity, like projects that need to do liquidations, for example, they can use liquidity on Balancer. So, if we have a lot of liquidity, then it's it's good to trade on Balancer because imagine, Andy, that uh, you have many pools on Balancer that have MKR and DAI. So the, their prices are not exactly the same. They're very close because the market is like synced and there's arbitragers like doing that work. But some of the pools are slightly more expensive, like MKR is slightly more expensive. For some pools, it's slightly, slightly cheaper. So the more pools you have, the more liquidity you have, the better it is for buyers. Like buyers will always find the pool that's a little bit cheaper than the others and start buying from that pool and then buy from the others. But whereas sellers will sell to the to the pools that are paying more. So you kind of have this uh, yeah variety of, of prices and, and slippages. And we have something called the SOR, Smart Order Router, where if you just want to trade maker to die, which is like anyone wants to trade A for B, it automatically finds the best combination of pools uh, in the balancer ecosystem and splits your trade in an optimal way so uh, so as for you to get the most return possible considering price, uh, gas costs, so prices of, of gas on Ethereum. So yeah, our vision is, is really to be this um, flexible primitive where people get creative. And um, yeah, I can I, I can talk more about something that's very exciting that we are uh, we are like just rolling out out and and, and more and more people are using, uh, which is smart pools, if you want. Hey, look, uh, ab- absolutely, and well, just before we do that, I you know I love the way you uh, you said I can't remember exactly what you said, but it, something along the lines of you know in, instead of paying fees to a traditional portfolio manager to uh, index you know, fund managers, yeah. Actively manage and yeah rebalance your uh, your fund. Instead, you're collecting fees from traders, which is it's yeah it sounds uh, it's such a a crazy concept, but very clever. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's it's amazing because that that wouldn't be possible without um, without Ethereum or without smart contracts, trustlessly uh, allowing people to buy and sell. Right, you need intermediaries. You need like twelve different institutions to do that in the conventional financial world. And Ethereum allows us to do that without anyone, um, without any middleman. So that's that's the power of, uh, yeah, 
blockchain and, and programmable, it's programmable, yeah, programmable money. Um, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, so to, you, yeah, you mentioned um, smart pools. I think. So, yeah. Yeah. What's what's a smart pool? Yeah, that, that's something that's really exciting, uh, and we're ro- rolling out more and more use cases or examples of smart pools. So, as, so before we talk about smart pools, it's important to distinguish the types, the two native types of pools we have on Balser. We have two native types. The first one is the private pools. And private pools only accept liquidity from the creator, their creator. So, and you you have a portfolio you want to um, rebalance using Balser. You create your pool, you add your assets, and since it's only you who can provide liquidity to it. The, you have uh, all the flexibility of changing weights, adding new tokens, uh, changing your pool in any way you want, uh, increasing the trading fees or decreasing trading fees. Um, so, but you are the only one who can put liquidity there. The other type is shared pools. Shared pools are very similar to Uniswap pools. Uh, they, they allow anyone to provide liquidity and get shares of that pool. But on the flip side, that, that pool is immutable. So the, the, the types of tokens, the weights, and the trading fee, all those parameters cannot change. Why? Because otherwise the creator of the pool would, would be able to indirectly drain value from the pool by adding a token that they control and then drain all the others, right? So it's a protection mechanism. So you have those two types natively. The, the cool thing about smart pools is that it's sort of a, it works as a, a hybrid. So you can imagine of it as a pool that has flexible parameters and lets people also invest. So people who are investing have to trust the controller of that uh, smart pool uh, that if they can add new tokens, they're not going to uh, add a, a token that, that can drain everyone's money. Of course, there's some mechanisms to protect that, like a, a time lock. So anytime the controller of that pool adds a token, then people have, I don't know, a month to withdraw their liquidity if, you, if they don't like that uh, that addition, that new token. So um, I, I don't think it's worth it to, but just quickly how that works then um, uh, under the hood. The smart pool is actually a, a, a private pool that can be changed uh, like any other, but the owner of that private pool is not you, it's not a person, it's not a, a, an EOA, an externally owned address, it's another smart contract, which is the smart pool controller. And that controller works as a gateway for liquidity to enter the private pool it owns. So you and I can send liquidity to that controller. The controller says, okay, Andy now has 10% of the pool. Fernando has 5%. I'm sending that liquidity that they sent me to my private pool. And that private pool works like a, a normal private pool where people can trade and it generates fees. But the, the, the controller serves as a gateway to add and remove liquidity uh, for external people. But that controller can do specific things and that's variable. So there are some smart pools where all, all, all the controller can do is change the trading fee. And this is a surge pricing pool. It's a, a dynamic pricing pool. And I like to make an analogy to make it easier to understand. It's like Uber for liquidity pools, whereas what we have today is taxis. Like imagine um, uh, on, on, on a day where there's a lot of demand for, for trading, for liquidity. Uh, markets are crashing. People are hurrying to buy, die to close their vaults to avoid being liquidated on MakerDAO and, and other protocols as well. They don't care if they're paying 0.3%, 0.5% or 1%. All they want to do is guarantee that they, they're buying DAI for a price uh, that is right now because they know that in a few hours it might be half that. Uh, that like That's a um, doom scenario of, of Black Thursday, but it, it can happen in, in crypto quite often. So in, in those cases, what that pool is going to do, there's a lot of volatility, a lot of demand for trading it will increase the trading fee from, let's say, 0.3 to 2%, and people will still be trading. And all of a sudden, that pool is going to be a lot more profitable, attracting more liquidity providers, making it even better for traders, because the more liquidity providers, the lower the slippage, the bigger the trades it can support without changing its price a lot. That's the basics of AMM. So the more liquidity, the, the, low, the lower the slippage. And, and, and that kind of is a, is a flywheel effect. It attracts more liquidity, so it attracts more trades, it makes more, uh, yeah, more trading fees, and so on and so forth. And the magic here is, is just like what Uber did. Like it, it matches demand to supply. So if there's a Friday, Friday evening, raining, no one wants to drive, the prices go up to attract more drivers to the streets to work for Uber. 
So uh, the same happens here. If, if there's a, a very calm time, no, no demand for, for trading or very low, very low volatility, the pool decreases the, 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 the trading fee. So this is just one use case of smart pools. So the Uber of liquidity pools. Yeah, and I I know you've uh, you've talked about or you've used the example of I think it's called Realty, right? Yes. Which is, uh, I believe it's a, a real estate index fund building on tokenized mm-hmm. real estate. So in this case, the smart pool tokens would represent ownership of that index right? yeah let me yeah that that is uh, another example i love so the as you said realty is building uh is, is kind of making it possible for people to for people to buy shares of properties and get paid the rents every day and die that's amazing to me like it blows my mind so uh that so the, what what they would like to have and and that's what they're building on, on top of balancer is Index funds of those properties, so people can be exposed to many properties, uh, and and they have like a, a share of a balancer pool that has all those properties. However, if you think of a shared pool, Andy, that would have the problem that every new property that's added, uh, as as I mentioned, a shared pool is static; it's um, it's immutable. Uh, they would have to create. Let's say they have already four properties; they have a fifth one. They would have to create a new pool with all the four existing ones plus the fifth new one, and a hope for people to migrate their liquidity from the old pool to the new pool because balancer is completely non-custodial and uh, yeah, you, you can't force liquidity to go anywhere. People have to do that themselves. So of course, if they add new new properties like every month, they would end up with uh, hundreds of pools at eventually with liquidity fragmented all over the place. So what they need is a smart pool that has the right to add and remove tokens. So... The way it works is very simple. It's a smart pool. They start with four properties. As they add a new property, they just, um, yeah, they signal to the smart contract, I want to add this fifth property. And then people have like a month to withdraw their liquidity if they think they're being attacked. But Realty is like already being the, the intermediary with the real world with those properties. So people have no reason to distrust uh, Realty. But anyway, they can, they can rage quit. And after a month, uh, Realty can, can kind of really uh, apply this change and add the token. And then magically, everyone's now exposed to all, five, uh, to all five properties without having to migrate their liquidity. So the nice thing about that is that eventually Realty will hopefully become a collateral type on MakerDAO. So MakerDAO uh, hopefully will vote in the real estate uh, Realty token. And that token cannot be changing every month or every six months, right? That token has to be quite stable. And with smart pools, you can start evolving, uh, keeping the same, the same smart pool token uh, unchanged. You can evolve like downwards. So you can have, uh, you can start adding properties. When you get to the eighth property, Balancer has a limit of eight, uh, eight tokens per pool. You can start removing properties themselves by pools of properties. So like cities. So now you have, instead of uh, eight properties around the U.S., you have um, eight cities. And then each city has different properties. So you can have up to 64 properties kind of in this tree. Uh, and always without changing the, the token that's being used as collateral for MCD. This is always the same address on Etherscan, right? That, that, that's the interesting thing. So, yeah, it, it, to me, it's mind-blowing, like the, 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 the fact that you can... Uh, change things, and all the liquidity providers are automatically uh, exposed to the new assets. Or if if some some properties are removed, they are all like tagging along with the with the smart pool strategy. Fascinating. Well, that that will be uh, an interesting pool uh, smart pool to keep an eye on. Uh, look, uh, Fernando, I, I want to cover off um, liquidity mining. Right, just you know. Talk to me about liquidity mining because that has obviously been one of the key themes of 2020, and also just uh, maybe tie in uh, the the balance, the the BAL, the BAL governance token um, on on the balancer network. Absolutely. So liquidity mining is a mechanism to get uh, a, a protocol or yeah a platform to a decentralized stage. So Balancer started with investors, with a founding team, with advisors. Unfortunately, back then there was no concept of fair launch and 
um, yeah, it, it was just like the way things worked. And I, I really think there's like different pros and cons for uh, launches without any investors or pre-mine and anything. Uh, like yep. it's obviously like you need money to pay for expensive audits. We, we had three very expensive audits with the three of the best uh, auditing companies. So all of that like needs some, some capital to bootstrap. But we don't want to be a, a, a VC coin or a centralized protocol. We really want to be as decentralized as possible. And uh, this, this is hard, right? You have to expect people to, to purchase the token. And uh, there's, there's a few ways people have done this in the past to, like, to, to get the, the, the tokens out there and uh, get to a healthy distribution. There's been airdrops. There's been ICOs where people pay for tokens. And liquidity mine is this new paradigm that uh, I think Hummingbird and, and SNX started uh, last year, which is like, I'm going to give my tokens to the people who are using the protocol, who are really adding value, who are really caring and, and yeah, are, are involved with the protocol. So for Balser, we thought a lot about who those stakeholders and users are. And it became clear over time that the liquidity providers are kind of uh, starting the like the wheel or, or making the wheel start to spin. If there's liquidity providers, there's traders. And if there's traders, there's trading fees. Then the liquidity providers are profitable. That attracts more liquidity providers. So it's, it, those, those are the key users that, uh, in our opinion, should be getting more and more ownership of the protocol. So the, the, the main objective here is to say, like, after a few years of giving away ownership of the protocol to the people using it, it will hopefully become decentralized and uh, yeah, it worked. It will, it will be able to work without uh, Balancer Labs kind of uh, doing, doing development and, and, and helping out more actively. So it will hopefully be like Ethereum or, or, uh, or Linux where people just are involved and there's like grants and different common goods uh, kind of uh, sponsorships like Gitcoin on Ethereum. So that, that's our end goal. And liquidity mining sounded to us the, like the best way to to yeah to distribute ownership of the pro- of the protocol. Sure, sure. And just as we as we start to to finish off uh, this segment of the podcast, there's still a couple of things I, I want to get through actually. But um, so firstly, where do you see the state of DeFi at the moment as we sort of start to to close out 2020? And it's it's been a you know, a, a crazy old year. Um, and, and what about, you know, layer two solutions, uh, you know, particularly relevant to uh, Ethereum in this context? And how would layer two solutions potentially um, be applied to, to balancers? Is that something that you're looking at? Maybe not even on, on kind of gas, get you know, the gas fees, but like on front running, uh, anything that you're looking at there and, and just, yeah, com- thoughts on on DeFi in general at the moment? Yeah, so great question. I think, so first DeFi, I think this is uh, a revolution that's just getting started. It will have cycles, have, it will have ups and downs. And uh, yeah, we haven't seen much of it yet. So we'll, we'll be impressed by, by things that will happen in the future. There might be like some major issues like hacks or I don't know, that that are, uh, has problems or... There's like a, a lot of things that could go wrong, but I, I do think that this is this has come to stay and it will revolutionize the world. I can't see like uh, conventional finance uh, untouched by DeFi, by Ethereum in, in say like 10 years. Everything will be will be different because it's so much more efficient and fair. So uh, yeah, that, that is to DeFi. In 2020, getting to a close, um, I, I think that it's been a, a great year. Um, especially for Balancer, it's the, the year we launched. But for DeFi in general, I think we proved that there is demand for, uh, for, for, for DeFi and for yeah, tokenized assets. And then that came, like that brought with itself the, the problem of scalability or surfaced the problem of scalability on Ethereum. And I also don't see a future without Layer 2s. Uh, and I think like uh, a few days ago, Vitalik uh, published his article on uh, ETH 1.5 and, and that's it. So uh, going more uh, down the line of uh, down a path of roll roll ups uh, instead of having lots of shards for ETH 2.0. Uh, I, I think we'll, we'll we'll very soon start using lots of uh, optimistic roll ups, 
And the only, so we're, we're watching that closely, will definitely uh, benefit a lot from scalability and uh, lower fees because whatever goes to miners should be going to LPs or to arbors. So yeah, it's, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a pity for our LPs that fees are so high on, on Ethereum. So we, we're just making sure that we, we choose the, or the, the one solution or the solutions that keep composability. So that's, to us, it's the magic of DeFi and it has to be uh, kept intact in order for an L2 solution to be successful. You have to be able to atomically interact with, uh, with SNX and, and, then, and then Uniswap and, and Balancer um, to be able to really have like true, the true benefits of, of DeFi. But I, I think this is uh, six months to a year away and we'll see, we'll see that happening soon. And just on 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 the layer two, have you have you seen the the glue on layer two solution that the the leverage guys have built? Mm, I heard of it, but haven't delved into much detail, uh, unfortunately, yet. Yeah, no, that's that that's an interesting one. That's uh, that's uh, yeah being deployed at the moment, and uh, yeah, potentially a, a little bit ahead of the the optimistic roll ups that uh, <laughs> that Vitalik, Vitalik is talking about, nice. but. Um, I thought it was interesting. I saw that you guys at Balancer, you're working with uh, Trent at Ocean Protocol, right? Yeah. And there's, I guess, uh, you know, that's uh, described as the first uh, automated market maker for data because that's what o- Ocean Protocol does. So again, that's a, a, another use case again. But uh, yeah, I thought that was quite interesting. It is. It's it's absolutely interesting. It, the, the Yeah, the idea of data as... as um, assets that you can sell and, and monetize and capitalize on. That is amazing. And, and, and uh, yeah, like Trent was very excited with Balancer because one of the major challenges they had was how to price data. And this is what AMMs do, right? They let the market find the sweet spot uh, uh, for the price and uh, let anyone trade, that, like buy or sell for, for, for that price. So that's that's really useful for, for them. And, and it's, it's like a use case I really never had anticipated um like when i created balancer like data data markets on balancer i would have never have thought so that's that's exactly what balancer is for it's like a primitive for people to get creative and i'm sure a lot of uh such examples will will be happening in the near future like where well i would never have thought that people would use balancer for that Yes, indeed. Okay, well, well, let's uh, just before we go to a break, and, and then we'll come back and we'll finish off with the very famous crypto conversation hot take round. But yeah, well, let's clo- close this part of the podcast out. What's what's next on on the roadmap? Can you can you sort of talk to any new products or or features uh, that you guys are, are working on now that are in the pipeline? Yeah, so we are working a lot on, on making smart pools more accessible. So this uh, UI where anyone will be able to create a smart pool. And one, one other nice use case for, uh, for smart pools is LBPs, liquidity bootstrapping pools that I forgot to mention, which to me is, is gonna be more and more used. Uh, this idea of projects selling their tokens at the same time having liquidity. So uh, it's like a balancer pool that changes the weights uh, and flips the weights. And uh, you, you, the team starts with a, a lot of, the pool has a lot of project tokens, but ends up with a lot of ETH and then they can withdraw and pay for their operations. But all along the way, it's a normal balancer pool that people can trade back and forth. So you have liquidity for your token as well. So that, that is something we're working on, like how, how to make that very easy to use and to create. And we're also working very heavily on balancer V2. That will be very interesting. There will be a lot of uh, gas optimizations, a new architecture. Uh, new features. It will. Uh, I can't really tell much about that, but I can tell that it's going to be a lot cheaper to trade on Balancer. It's going to be a lot more flexible, um, and and yeah, it's 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 something we're looking very very much forward to. Fantastic. All right. Well, let's go to a very quick break, and then we'll come back with the crypto conversation hot take round. 
Whether you're an enterprise fund manager or a retail trader, buying and selling cryptocurrencies successfully requires price discovery you can rely on. Brave New Coins liquid indices provide trusted US dollar prices for Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Ripple. Featuring end of day or intraday outputs, you can count on the BLX, ELX, and XRPLX for accurate US dollar pricing for smart contract oracles, settlement price discovery, net asset valuation, and performance analysis. Visit bravenewcoin.com to find out more. All right, we're back, and I'm with Fernando Martinelli. Fernando is the founder and CEO of The Balancer Automated Asset Management Platform for Programmable Liquidity. Fernando, hey, I like to finish each podcast with a quick round of rapid-fire crypto conversation hot takes. Are you up for it? Yes, I am. Excellent. Just want your hot takes, your hot fire, take your best shot. Here we go, Fernando. Uh, where would you say that you sit on the Bitcoin maximalist to multi-coin opportunist spectrum? Um, a lot further to the open Ethereum uh, Ethereum side than maximalist. Even though I started as a ma- as a maximalist uh, very early on, yeah. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a, it's a common journey. Uh, well, Fernando, what would you say is your firmest conviction, a crypto opinion? That finance, the finance world will be like forever changed with uh, Ethereum or smart contracts in general. Very nice. Okay. Well, look, I ask every guest this question. A bit of a contentious one. Who do you think wins the American presidential election 2020? Biden. I hope. Okay. All right. I won't ask you to say why. We'll just have to see. Um, Look, Bill Gates famously said that we tend to overestimate what we can accomplish in two years and underestimate what we can accomplish in in 10. What does, you know, whatever you like, blockchain, DeFi, Balancer, uh, what does it all look like in in 10 years time? Balancer, I hope it's uh, it's a big project that is a common good and people are adding to it uh, voluntarily through smart design incentives uh, and, and the BAO token, governance token. I see it as an underlying primitive for the new financial order or world that will be on-chain. And uh, yeah, that, that's my hope for, for Balancer in 10 years. Excellent. Well, hey, I, uh, I certainly hope that that comes to pass. Um, but sci-fi author William Gibson, you'll be familiar with this quote. He said that the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Can you think of an example, Fernando, of the future being here right now? Uh, but, but most people just aren't really aware of it. That's a good one. Well, I think, I think it's, it's crypto. Crypto is the best example. Uh, more specifically, maybe tokenized assets. People will, will that it, it will be obvious for people to have a private key that they can just store in their heads that owns a, a house or like something very big, and they don't need paper or or um, yeah any anything uh, physical to own things. So yeah. Absolutely, very much agree. Okay, well, uh, it's time to get a little bit weird. Fernando, let's zoom out. What do you see as the long-term future for the human race? Do you sense a dystopia or utopia? I think utopia. So people will be, the, the society will be more efficient and we'll have UBI, um, universal basic income. Everyone will have a, a good, comfortable life, even those who opt not to work or do anything at all and uh, well let's see I hope that's going to be the outcome. Interesting that you should mention UBI because I used to have that as a question in, in the crypto conversation hot take round but I kind of I dropped it but um, yeah what's what's your it's kind of I know it's hard to give a hot take but you see UBI as um, as a positive thing and, and something that that should happen? Absolutely I think there's so many uh in, like jobs that will be just vanished or, or yeah exterminated by AI and, and, and generalized AI and those people will have to be like will have to eat and uh, go to the movies and do things and AI is gonna add so much value and um, a- automation will add so much more value than it does today that will be it will be enough for us to uh, give money to all the people who chose not to work but yeah, I want to have uh, 
lead a, 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 a nice, comfortable life. And I want, I, I want to say that like 100 people working in things that can be replaced by robots, if all of them uh, study other things and uh, pro programming, and, and if only five of them become uh, programmers that would be otherwise just like had a cashier getting money and giving money back, that would already add a lot more value to, to society than uh, they would if they all kept working. Uh, with things that can easily be uh, replaced by robots or, or by AI. Fascinating. Yes, I, I think I tend to agree. And I think, you know, if we uh, if the goal is to w move towards a world of abundance, then, yeah, some kind of UBI is, is probably a, a necessary part of, of that society. And uh, that kind of leads us to the final question, uh, Fernando, which is, uh, what is your favourite science fiction book a film, show, or universe? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I like Isaac Asimov, but I recently I read The Three Body Problem by a Chinese yes. author, and I, I really liked it a lot, so I, I'd, I'd say that today that would be my answer. Yeah. Yes, I uh, I think I've, I've yeah I've, I've either maybe I haven't read that but I've read the Wikipedia <laughs> summary of it but yeah that's a that's a famous piece of yeah sci-fi and uh, and I love that as a selection and I'll definitely put a link uh, to that in the show notes. Cool, fantastic, nice. All right, well, hey, Fernando, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for talking to me today. Nothing else to say, really, except to say uh, the microphone is yours. Please take us out. Please tell the people where they can go to find more about you on your various platforms and, and where they can go to to learn more about uh, what you guys are building at Balancer Labs. Thanks so much, Annie. It was, uh, it was great. Uh, awesome questions. Great conversation. So anyone wanting to learn more about Balancer can go to balancer.finance and there there's links to our Twitter, to our Discord. There is no Telegram channel. If you're on a Telegram channel, you're being scammed. So watch out. We, uh, yeah, we, we talk a lot to the community on Discord and uh, yeah, we announce things on Twitter and are quite active there too. So we are uh, Balancer Labs on Twitter. I am FC Martinelli on Twitter and yeah, please join our Discord, um, be like participate, be active in governance. There's votes every now and then. So if you hold BAL tokens, even if they are in, in balancer pools, they are uh, being put to use, let's say, you can still vote with those BAL tokens that are in, in pools that you own. So yeah, Snapshot is a, is, a, is a tool that allows that, that we initially created, but uh, we just, uh, want it to be used by anyone it's an open source like free to use uh, yeah common good so yeah thanks so much andy and uh, it was great to be here fantastic all the best and uh, we'll talk again soon bye for now take care bye